Hey everyone, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to continue the Retro Console GPU Breakdown series by deep diving into the heart of the PlayStation 2's graphics technology, the Graphics Synthesizer, or GS for short. This little chip powered some of the most iconic games of all time, from Gran Turismo 3 to Shadows of the Colossus. But how did Sony pull off such impressive visuals for back in 2000? Well, stick around because we're going to be breaking down all of its specs, how it worked, and the clever integration of the PS2's memory system. But before we begin, if you are new to the channel and enjoy tech videos like these, consider subscribing to catch my weekly uploads. And finally, if you enjoy this video at all, make sure to smack the like button, that way YouTube shares this video to others who may enjoy it as well. I really appreciate all of your support. Now let's Let's just dive right into it. So what exactly is the graphics synthesizer? Launched with the PS2 on March 4th, 2000, it's Sony's custom GPU designed to handle the console's 3D rendering. Built initially on a 250 nanometer process, pretty chunky by today's standards, it ran at over just 147 megahertz. Later models did shrink this down to 90 nanometers and combined it with the Emotion engine, we'll get into that a little bit later, and packed around 54 million transistors, which was a pretty big deal at the time, and had a die size of 279 square millimeters in its original form. If we break down the GPU and what it contains, we start with the 16 pixel pipelines used to turn raw 3D data into the finished 2D picture on the TV. Eight texture mapping units, which takes the 2D images and applies them to 3D models for texture detail, and 16 render output units, which take pixel data like color, texture, and effects from the pipelines and performs final blending operations. These specs gave the graphics synthesizer a pixel fill rate of 2.36 gigapixels per second and a texel fill rate of 1.18 gigatexels per second. Sony claimed it could push upwards of 75 million polygons per second in real games, though with textures and effects it was more realistically like 15 to 20 million, and supported resolutions from 256 by 224 up to 640 by 448, and with progressive scan 480p for those crisp visuals in compatible titles. But to back up all of these specs with the GPU, Sony had some magic and a little trick up their sleeve. It was the secret weapon known as the Embedded DRAM, otherwise known as EDRAM, with a capacity of 4 megabytes built right into the chip. This wasn't just any RAM though, it was lightning fast with a crazy wide 2560 bit internal bus clocked at 150 megahertz. That delivered a total of 48 gigabytes per second of memory bandwidth. To put that in perspective, that's over 15 times faster than the PlayStation 2's main RAM bandwidth. For the year 2000, this was actually pretty insane. But what did this 4 megabytes of super fast memory actually do? Well, it basically stored frame buffers, usually two for double buffering and texture buffers, and a Z buffer for depth sorting. At 640 by 448 p with 32-bit color, a single frame buffer did take about 1 megabyte of memory, so double buffering ate up about half of the EDRAM available. The rest was used as basically a high-speed scratch pad for textures and rendering data. Developers did have to be clever with this limited memory while constantly streaming assets into this tiny space, but that 48 gigabytes a second bandwidth made it work like a dream. And now here's where things get a little bit more interesting compared to what specs we see in consoles today or for a long time now, and that is the graphics synthesizer did not work alone. It actually teamed up with the PS2's Emotion Engine, or EE, the CPU that handled geometry and math. The EE had two vector processing units, VU0 and VU1. Cranking out 6.2 gigaflops total, VU1 was the star here, directly linked to the graphics synthesizer via the graphics interface, or GIF. Think of the GIF as a high-speed highway, moving data at 1.2 gigabytes a second. The Emotion Engine worked in clever ways. The Emotion Engine's VPUs transformed 3D geometry, vertices, lighting, all that jazz, and turned it into display lists. The VU1 sent these lists to the graphics synthesizer through the GIF, and then the graphics synthesizer took over from there, rasterizing those polygons into 2D pixels across its 16 pipelines. It applied textures from the EDRAM, then added effects like alpha blending and fog, and rendered everything into the frame buffer. And finally, you have the finished frame hit your TV screen. It was all this teamwork that did let the PS2 hit real-world polygon counts of 15 to 20 million per second in high-effect games, which was definitely something new for the time when it was released. Now, of course, the EDRAM wasn't the only memory that the PlayStation 2 had. It did also have 32 megabytes of main RDRAM, otherwise known as RAMBUS DRAM, running at 400 megahertz 
megahertz with a dual channel setup for 3.2 gigabytes per second bandwidth. Compared to the graphic synthesizer's 48 gigabytes per second ED RAM, it is admittedly slow, but it played a crucial role with its capacity. The RD RAM stored all the game data, models, textures, code, and streamed it to the Emotion Engine and graphic synthesizer as needed. The Emotion Engine's DMA controller, a 16 kilobyte sketchpad, kept things flowing smoothly throughout this entire process. For example, textures started in the RD RAM, got compressed sometimes via the image processing unit, and streamed into the graphic synthesizer's ED RAM. That 4 megabytes acted like a turbocharged buffer, while the 32 megabytes was the big storage warehouse. Developers had to juggle this tight memory setup, often sticking with low res 256 by 256 textures, but the graphics synthesizer made it look seamless. And all of these specs and features is what really made the graphics hardware inside the PlayStation 2 shine. That high fill rate and bandwidth crushed it for fast paced games. The Emotion Engine's VPUs added flexibility, faking effects like shadows and particles that the graphics synthesizer couldn't do natively, but it wasn't perfect. No programmable shaders meant it relied on fixed functions, unlike the Xbox GPUs in the same generation. The 4 megabytes ED RAM was tiny as well, forcing constant streaming and anti-aliasing was definitely limited as a result, leaving some jagged edges in certain games. Still, if we look at my aforementioned examples, Shadow of the Colossus with its vast draw distances and procedural animations, or Gran Turismo 3 with its very detailed cars, the graphics synthesizer punched way above its weight, helping the PS2 become one of the best-selling consoles ever, amongst other things. And that's just about it that breaks down the graphics synthesizer, a 2000s tech marvel blending raw speed, clever design, and developer ingenuity. And pretty much wraps up everything I want to talk about today involving the graphics hardware inside the PS2. And I will be covering more hardware in these videos in the future. I know I cover mainly the GPU because I started this series as a GPU breakdown series. I will definitely be adding CPUs and other hardware specs depending on the console in future videos. So for those who have commented down below about that type of thing, Thing, just keep your eyes out because I will be touching base with all the consoles I've already covered and will cover in the future with CPU coverage if I haven't already. And as a final thought, I gotta say, the PS2 really blew me away back in the day. If you watched my videos before, you may have heard me make comments about getting next-gen consoles last, and I quite literally, growing up, would get consoles as their next-generation variants were released. So when news of the PS3 was being talked about is when I finally started to have the possibility of getting my hands on a PS2, but up until that point, I would just see it at friends' houses. I had an N64, and you should have seen my face the day I went over a friend's house and saw Grand Theft Auto Vice City playing for the first time. I couldn't believe that a game world could have so much going on in it, and it seems pretty primitive and silly today, but back in the early 2000s, it was really something interesting, especially if you grew up on the more primitive consoles and the prior gen consoles like an N64 PS1 to see that next generation leap. But I want to know, what are your favorite PS2 games that showed off the GPU and truly had you impressed back in the day? Comment below so I can not only thank you for watching this far in the video and so I can engage with you further, which I really love to do with you all in the comments. I hope you all have a great morning, afternoon, or evening, and I'll see you all in the next video. Peace.